for those listening for the first time, I have my first sponsor, and I could not think of a better one than mempool.space, a fantastic Bitcoin block explorer. We are still using Wiz's mempool here, but like most things in my life, I'm moving towards free and open source software, and you get that with this Bitcoin block explorer. So you do not need to trust Wiz's mempool, i.e. mempool.space. You can easily host it yourself. More to come on this front at the park in 2023. But Mempool is becoming much more than your traditional block explorer. It is becoming a multi-layer explorer from layer zero Mempool, layer one, the Bitcoin blockchain, layer two plus like Lightning, Liquid, and more. And that more part is for those interested in Bitcoin mining. They have a robust mining dashboard, which I check every day. So give it a shot yourself at mempool.space. My second show supporter, and it is Blockstream Jade. Blockstream Jade is an open source hardware wallet for the cold storage of Bitcoin and Bitcoin Layer 2 assets on Liquid, such as stablecoins and security tokens. I personally only use my Blockstream Jade for storing Bitcoin, but that is me. Blockstream Jade houses a camera and full color display, allowing for fully air gapped Bitcoin transactions. You can scan and display QR codes directly on the device to sign transactions and verify addresses with ease and peace of mind. You can manage your assets from mobile or desktop with Jade-compatible wallets such as Blockstream Green, Blue Wallet, Electrum, and my personal choice and favorite, Sparrow. Go to blockstream.com forward slash Jade, J-A-D-E, to learn more and also buy one if you're so inclined. I just think there's so much room for different storytelling in the space. I feel like we haven't even touched the surface with the kind of stories we can tell around Bitcoin. I still think we limit ourselves to maybe, you know, digital gold narratives and things. And and they are narratives that we should um, take seriously and, and, and are true for the most part. But Bitcoin is so much more than that to me anyway. And um, yeah, that was just the effort to, you know, try and bring a, bring a bit more fun and, and uh, friendliness to, to Bitcoin. Welcome to the Builders in Bitcoin podcast, a podcast about the people who bring Bitcoin to life. I'm your host, Rod, and I go by the handle BitKite on Twitter. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Connor Okus, former professional footballer and current product manager at Spiral. Connor's practical and cooperative approach to life can be an inspiration for anyone looking to change gears in their career and start working in Bitcoin, specifically open source. In this episode, we discuss and dig into Connor's career before Bitcoin and his path to Bitcoin, the practicalities of sustainable open source development, the importance of easily digestible and accessible educational resources for Bitcoin newbies, and a lot more. I really enjoyed my conversation with Connor, and I hope you will too. So let's just jump right in. Connor Okus, welcome to the Builders and Bitcoin podcast. Thanks for having me, man. You doing all right, my man? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing van freaking tastic. Um, nice. I've been a fan from afar and just watching you and being a Twitter lurker, if you will, <laughs> just seeing all of the the cool stuff that you've been tinkering on as well as the Spiral team. So it truly is a, a an honor to have you here yeah, on campus. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Uh, so you flew in from London? <laughs> it's an interesting one for me. So I've just moved to the US, actually. What? Yeah, so I did fly in um, from London, but I flew into Nashville via Miami. <laughs> so did you move to Miami? I have, yeah. So I've moved to Miami. Um, it's kind of been on my agenda for a long while, just for a number of different reasons. Yeah. Um, but yeah, glad to glad to be here. It just feels it feels right. The energy feels good. So. Yeah. Well. Uh... I'm not going to take over the entire podcast with a whole recruiting trip for uh, to <laughs> yeah. recruit you to Nashville. Um, but uh, this was not on my radar. And now <laughs> I am, and I'm looking at Tom, like, how did I miss? Uh, we call them D1 athletes here in the States. Okay. Like when they're like a division one athlete, like five-star athlete. Yeah, You're yeah. like a five-star Bitcoiner that we just missed on a whole <laughs> recruiting opportunity to bring them to, to Nashville, Tennessee. The cool thing is, I will say, about here in Nashville is just whether you, you move here, which, you know, highly recommend, mm-hmm. uh, or come here for a meetup or come here mm-hmm. for a week or a month just to work from the park, um, the door is always open. So. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we've been here just two days and like, the facilities are <laughs> unreal. 
I'm like, no, genuinely, I, I'm not just saying it because you're here and stuff, but genuinely, like, we walked in and we're like, yeah, this is a lot more than what we was expecting. Like, this is, feel like you can be productive here, yeah. you know? Like, you just, you know, not every office has that vibe of, like, I'm going to get stuff done here, but I'm also going to, you know, speak to my fellow Bitcoiner and riff and learn stuff and collaborate. You just It just has that feel. So, good job. Job, yeah, man. we definitely got super lucky. So that's mm. for dang sure mm. um, by finding this place. But that those uh, kind words mean a, a immense amount to me as well as I know Matt. Um, so thank you for that. The That's exactly what we want to do is have a place where people can kind of feel like they can easily come in and plug in mm. and then have mm. the opportunity to like pop their head up and say, oh, there's Stephen DeLorme from the Bitcoin design community. Man, I've been catching up with him on all of these um, – you know, design calls. Now I want to riff with him on XYZ project in real life or grab a beer with him and talk about uh, uh, ABC thing. So um, that's like the purpose, I guess, around here for the local community as well as the global community. Um, but enough about Bitcoin Park. Mm -hmm. This is the Builders in Bitcoin podcast. So this podcast is kind of focused on the people that I personally and selfishly think bring Bitcoin to life. And as a PM for Spiral, I truly think you're one of those people. Um, and we're going to get into Spiral. We're going to get into Hello Bitcoin because I have a million questions on that. But I really want to start because I am a huge soccer fan. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to, for this podcast, I'm going to call it football uh, out appreciate of respect. It. appreciate it. Um, but there's so, uh, like the English football community and scene is so amazing. And it, yet it's so different than what we've grown accustomed to in the States. Like the three of us, me, you, and Tom were just talking about the franchise model here in the States across basketball, baseball, um, soccer even now with the MLS and the NFL now, or not now, but from the get-go. But in overseas and, and pretty much all of the European leagues, um, there's a relegation model. Mm -hmm. And so, and not only the relegation model, but you have a community aspect. Because like uh, West Ham, which was your boyhood club, which is, I believe, and fact check me along the way, yep. is East London. It is, yeah. And so you grew up there outside the grounds mm -hmm. and you're kind of watching them play and so on. And then you get into the youth academy and then mm -hmm. you work your way up mm -hmm. and you make uh, one of their under- 18 teams or whatever youth that team, may be. Yeah. Youth team, exactly. Yeah. And you're working your way up. And we still don't even have that here in the States for any of our sports, okay. really. Interesting. Um, which is kind of a bummer. We actually go to the collegiate. That's why I was joking with the D1 uh, whole thing. Okay. And so one of the areas where I think there's a lot of similarities is the community um, aspect of supporting your boyhood club. Because how many football teams are there in just in England? Oh, man. Like, whew. There's, let's say, on average, 24 teams per league and there's, you know, 10 to 12 professional and semi-professional leagues. So, you know, whatever whatever, whatever that amounts to, my maths is not 240 amazing. to like 260, yeah, exactly. 280, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow. Um, and that's just in that kind of pyramid of football, like let alone just like Sunday league teams that are not professional and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, probably easy, easily up to like the thousands quite easily so that football is very much a religion in the uk but what's amazing there not only is it a religion it's one of the most if we love you know quote unquote free market competition mm. and what i love about it is every saturday is when you guys typically yeah, pay the typically, matches yeah. uh, and then a couple of games on sunday yeah but um you have to win or you have to you have to show up and perform because there's no you know salary cap or there's no way to buy your way into mm. the league or maintain your status in the league, mm. you got to be in the, let's say there's 10 teams per league or what's like it? Like 20, 24. Oh, sorry. Like, yeah. So 20, let's say 20. And then if you're in the bottom four, you're dropped down. Exactly. And you lose a lot of money. Exactly. You lose a lot of access to a lot of things. So like there's a big financial penalty. Yeah. What other worlds does that truly exist in? Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, that, that's a good point, though, because that truly hit home for me when I actually started playing, like, men's football, yeah. professional football. And as a kid, you're, you you grow up and you, you see all of these stars on TV and you kind of fantasize about, like, 
you know, playing in front of big crowds and scoring the winners in vital moments and all of this stuff. But that typically happens at the highest end of the game, right? Yeah. Like you're playing in front of 60,000, 70,000. People are chanting your name. You're on hundred thousands of pounds a week. But people don't understand that there's a there's another side to the game where you go down two or three divisions and you're playing in front of 2,000 people, 3,000 people on a cold winter day in some part of the north of England where it's not so glamorous and yeah. it's not so bright lights and maybe you're only on £2,000 a week, which is not a wage to, you know, turn your, your nose up at, but it's not what you'd be making in the Premier League and it's not retirement money. Yep. And for me, it really hit home and I was like kind of playing in, playing in the lower leagues of football. It's like I'm a 18, 19 year old. I'm playing in a team with a guy who's, you know, coming up to retirement. This is how he's paying his mortgage. Yeah, yeah. Like this is how he's feeding his kids. So when you're not, you know, when you're not up to scratch, when you're not doing it, when he's shouting at you, when you're like, when he's like, come on, like you need to give it a bit more. Like, yeah it's the desperation of like, this is my livelihood <laughs> at stake, you know. If we don't get these three points on a Saturday, the knock-on consequences are very bad, you know. So I guess that is why some of the players at the top of the game get paid what they get paid because not only are they able to maintain that mentality of like hunger and discipline while still being paid the big bucks, yeah. they're able to perform the most difficult skills at the highest level the most consistently you know, so. so was it really around the financial side that you decided or was it maybe on the playing side that you decided to hang up the it's a, it's a bit of both like it was a bit of financially this is not as lucrative as i'd hope it would be um the style of football changes the lower you get down in the divisions because it's less about it's, it's, it's actually just about winning. So there tends to be a style of football that plays that's more percentage-based. Let's get the ball in the areas the quickest where we can score as opposed to a more patient development, st you know, development yeah. style of football, um, which you see at higher levels of the game. So it was a combination of, I'm just not enjoying this style of football. I grew up in West Ham Academy. West yeah. Ham Academy is known for having some of the, you know, bringing through some of the best English players that the country's seen to go in from that to like a Dagenham and Redbridge where it's what we call route one. So get the ball forward as quick as you can from <laughs> defence to attack in one pass. And I'm a central midfielder. Ah, yeah. So playing that style of football for me was like, I might as well not be here. I'm just looking at the ball going from <laughs> back to front. Like, I might as well not be here, right? And I'm not getting paid very well to do it. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a spectrum of how one can experience the, the game yeah. of football in the UK. So, Well, we're going to come back to football because I have a, a few questions. And, and you mentioned you're now on the uh, board of Real Bedford. So we're going to yeah. definitely come back to that. Cool. Um, but so you, you hang up your boots and then you go and get into the, the business world. You go and do a couple of jobs and then you get into coding. Like how, did, what was the process for you to go from being a footballer to being a developer? Yeah, that's a good question, man. So I have parents who are um, very special in that they encouraged me to still educate myself while I was playing, let's say. Oh, so, cool. so so while I was playing, I was still going to college in the evening and self-studying. So I self-studied economics, English language, and then I did um, oh no, and psychology, and then I did an economics uh, A-level. I'm not sure what the equivalent is here. It's like when you're... Eight, 16 to 18 whatever those uh qualifications are so I, I i did all of that while i was playing anyway so in the event my career didn't pan out how i wanted to i could still fall back on those qualifications and go to university now i was gonna always going to be the type of person that if i didn't go to university i was going to do a trade i was going to become a plumber electrician painter something that was hands-on something that was trade and skill orientated um but I thought I could I could go a bit further and go to university. And I felt, well, what was the most practical thing I could possibly do at university? And after watching, basically, after watching the Social Network movie, the Facebook movie, I was like, oh, let me just learn to code. Right? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I swear, that, like, it sounds stupid, right? Like, I was just like, oh, I watched Social Network. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to learn to code. And, like, everything seems to be going in this direction of technology. Yeah. Like, I wasn't 
a super geek growing up, but I was into like my video games and computing and my dad tinkered a lot with like early web technologies and stuff. So we had like sprinkles of that in and around the house, but we were a sporting house. I was playing football. My brother yeah. played for Tottenham and all this kind of stuff. So I was like, let me try my hand at coding. Luckily, I had the qualifications and I ended up going to Goldsmiths University of London to study computer science. Oh, fantastic. Um, so that's basically where like the kind of programming, coding, technology side came into it. So it wasn't anything, like it wasn't some mastermind plan or anything. It was kind of just like an intuition that this might be a good direction to go in. And then, so you spent a few years working in like, I would just say tech mm. and for a broad sense. Yeah. And then how did you find Bitcoin? So I found Bitcoin through a colleague. So I was working at like a big media company at the time. Um, and I think just the very nature of being and working in tech, you hear about like different types of technology and Bitcoin was one of those. And my colleague was pretty much just like, just buy it, you need to buy this Bitcoin thing. And I didn't know like, well, I didn't know what Bitcoin was. I came to get rich. Yeah. Like, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to put some money in this thing's going to skyrocket. It was, what was this, 2017, like October, November sort of times. Um you know, peak of the bull market. Like I was thinking that, yeah, I'm going to make some substantial amount of money here. Obviously, shortly after the price tanked and because I had the technical background though, I had the impetus to go and learn about what this technology actually was. So I was like, I didn't, I didn't put my life savings into it or anything, but um, I, I was like, well, if I've lost this amount of money, let me actually go and find out what's behind this because there must be there must be something behind this right and that's when i just dove down the rabbit hole read master in bitcoin by andreas antonopoulos who i still consider probably the best educator we've had Excellent. on bitcoin in in totality anyway um read a lot of that stuff veered off into the world of ethereum as well as you do when you're like an early person into bitcoin and stuff you you know you think some of the other projects might um, have some merit have some merit and all of that kind of stuff and even just being a technical person you you, you want to understand the trade-offs between yep. all of this stuff anyway Absolutely. but ultimately came back to bitcoin and was like yeah this is this is where it's at this is where i want to be this is where i want to find a way to contribute um my technical skills my knowledge my passion this is where i want to be so um again not really like a, a, a too much of a an interesting story but like it was kind of like came to get rich but stayed for the principles yeah. and the, the ideology, you know? Yeah, you. I'm always fascinated by people that take the trade-off and then all of a sudden jump in and put their time, capital, and reputation yeah. all in on Bitcoin, the capital B, the monetary network, yeah. and then also Bitcoin, the lowercase b, the reserve asset. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, at Spiral and probably other places, it's actually probably uh, the financial reward uh, from a salary perspective, it's way less than a, a job at Google, a job at Microsoft, a mm -hmm. job at like working on the next AI, chat GPT-3, or whatever that may be. Yeah. So I, I am fascinated by people that are working in the space and devoting so much time and then taking that trade off, um, especially with younger folks. And then on the flip side, or not, in, in continuation on that, is there's some commercial opportunities that I think are super fascinating, whether that's in mining, lightning. But the folks that devote their time to work in open source out of all the things, like how did you decide when you're like, all right, I want to work in Bitcoin? Yeah. How did you decide to work specifically on open source? Yeah. I mean, that's interesting how it came about as well. So we have um, a conference in London called Advancing Bitcoin, which mm -hmm. is a a technical developer and designer conference shout out to leon johnson who's the organizer of that i basically like messaged him one day and was like you know how can i get involved and just like i just want i just basically just volunteered my time you're doing this conference like how can i help in any way like any way you need me how can i help um so i, I helped him you know with some organizational efforts around that um, and then the summer of, I think it was 2020, I was like, I wanted to find a way to more deeply start contributing to the Bitcoin open source community. And I was like, I predominantly did software engineering, but more on the front end side. So I was focused on like building the front ends for web apps and mobile apps and that kind of thing. And I, at the time, was quite frustrated with the user experience around a lot of the Bitcoin wallets and mm -hmm. products and stuff. So I was like, I, I want to find a way to maybe work with designers 
on improving the Bitcoin UX. At that exact time, Square Crypto, Spiral at the time, Spiral Now, created an initiative called the Bitcoin Design Community, which we can talk about a bit now as well. And I was like, oh, well, this is perfect. This is like exactly the community I need to be in. I can maybe collaborate with some designers. We can make some dope wallets. We can like, <laughs> you know, change the game in that regard. So started contributing to the Bitcoin design community. And then um, Steve Lee, my manager, who's the lead at Spiral, reached out to me and uh, offered me the opportunity to work on open source via a grant. Um, no strings attached funding to kind of work on a number of different things in the design community. Uh, so developer cool. libraries, some educational efforts as well. And that was a six-month grant. Um, and then kind of never looked back since then. So, yeah, we can, we can talk about what I do at Spiral now and stuff. But, yeah, that's kind of like my introduction into open source Bitcoin. Before that, I'd never contributed to open source as a developer at yeah. like the big tech companies I worked at and stuff. I'd never contributed to open source software before. So. I'm curious now because I feel like once you go open source, it's very, very oh. difficult to go back so. to working in a closed source, uh, big corp, even corporate mentality. Man, listen, like when I left my job, I was like, I'm never going back to big corporate again because like the way I left that job was a bit sour and, and things of that nature. But I, I, you're right, man. Even even before contributing to open source, that was kind of my mentality because like being in like big corporations, they do have like their trade-offs as well. Um, but you're right, when you can have a lot of autonomy with regards to where you work geographically, you know, the intensity that you yeah. work at every day, what you work on, the type of people you work with, having your work out in the open for people to critique and and also, like, revere, like, you get the, the, the both sides of the scale, right? Um, and it's and you know working in the open is definitely a way to like improve your skill set as well and like but you can also show people w what you're about as well in the same vein um, and also working in the open it just means more people are likely to use the stuff you're building totally. as well right so yeah I, I I'd find it difficult to go, to go back into that the closed corporate environment personally um, I think my team is like almost has the perfect kind of mix though and the perfect uh we sit perfectly within it all in my opinion so yeah it, it, to answer your question yeah definitely be tough for me i think yeah and and so and i want to get into this uh blog uh, very amazing blog post that we're going to link to in the show notes uh a framework for sustainable open source bitcoin development yep. but maybe we can shed a little bit of light on what it does spiral do and what mm. do you do for spiral because now you're a full-time employee of exactly. Spiral. Yeah. So after the grant I received from uh, Spiral Square Crypto at the time, which was a six-month grant, I was offered the opportunity to join the team full-time um, by my manager, Steve Lee, who's also an open-source um, Bitcoin PM as well. Um, and I'm a product manager at Spiral. So one of the thing that one of the things I do is, or one of the things that, well, let's talk about what Spiral does firstly, just for people who don't know. So... Spiral is an open source initiative at uh, Block. Um, Block is the conglomerate that is uh, Cash App, Square, Tidal, uh, TBD, and uh, we have a wallet team now as well. Um, and we're focused on basically giving back to the Bitcoin open source ecosystem in a number of different ways. So we're a group of technologies. At this point, we have, we have eight engineers and a few PMs. Amazing. Um, and the current streams of work that we're focused on are, you know, improving Bitcoin's uh, security, um, scalability, user experience, decentralization and privacy. So those are kind of the pillars that we're focused on, on improving on. Um, and we do it in a number of different ways. One is um, just provide no strings attached funding to talented people who want to work on open source Bitcoin projects. So that is through our grant program. So I'm currently man managing our grant program. At the time of this recording, we're probably at about 30 plus developers, oh, designers and PMs who are all being funded to work on open source Bitcoin projects. And they're um, dispersed geographically as well so across, at this point, 20 plus different countries now as well. Um, and they're working on everything from Bitcoin Core to Lightning Infrastructure, merchant efforts like BTC Pay Server, um, the Bitcoin design community, so user experience efforts, 
um, software development kits that make it easier for developers to build on Bitcoin. Um, so we're doing a whole host of of work in that area. So I'm always on the like lookout for talented people who want to start a career um, in open source Bitcoin development as well. In, to in total, I think we've given out around 60 grants at this point, maybe 60, 65 grants in total. Uh, the program's been running three, three four years now. Um, wow. And it's just continuing to grow. Um, and yeah, I mean, we have to give a shout out to, to Jack as well, the, the CEO, who's, um, you know, given us a lot of freedom to kind of choose the projects we want to work on, um, given us, you know, the impetus to just identify what we deem to be the most important things to push Bitcoin forward um, and not have necessarily this kind of top down approach. So we really appreciate that. So yeah, the grant program is one. And then the other one is something called the LDK, which our team of engineers um, work on um, full time for the most part. And the LDK, the Lightning Development Kit, is a is a uh, software development kit to make it easier to integrate Lightning features and functionality into any any wallet, any any Bitcoin product. So, yeah, and Cash App is using LDK right now for exactly. their Lightning implementation. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to have you answer this because <laughs> there's a lot of drama I'm feeling between the implementations from... Uh, not, I shouldn't even say a lot of drama, but like... Why did like, you say drama? Well... Uh, we're, Matt and I are going to host the Lightning Summit, the Power of Lightning Summit here at the park. Yeah. Uh, my goal with that is to lightningfy the entire campus. There is not a crazy idea you could bring to me mm -hmm. to integrate Lightning and Bitcoin and make <laughs> this campus truly come to life. Now, with that said, when I'm talking to folks about implementations or what they're using and so on, there's LDK, mm -hmm. there's Eclair, there's LND, mm -hmm. there's uh, uh, Core Lightning. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe those are the only four. Am I missing any other well, I implementations? Think, yeah, I think you got it. I think you yeah. Got it, yeah. So cool. And then there's like different trade offs associated with each of them. And then people are passionate about those trade offs. Um, but I, I guess from wh why I say drama is because I'm not as well educated or in the weeds of the mm -hmm. lightning community as I am with the, you know, the mining community, if you will. Yeah, so I, I can't say, I, I can't personally verify from what I hear like, oh, that's yeah. true or that's not true. I'm having to take trusted sources and uh, put all of this together. With yeah. all of that said, I cannot wait, and this is not meant to be a shill, <laughs> but I cannot wait for July to see this place come to freaking life. I okay. mean, that is my hope. Like you saw maybe last night when you were walking around the beautiful lights in the front of the patio. Oh, amazing, yeah. I was talking with uh, Paul from Voltage. I'm like, look, blank canvas, what, what could we do here? He's like, well, maybe we have like a, a, a SATS leaderboard with a QR code on, mm -hmm. on the wall and then you hit a certain threshold and you can change the lights to whatever color you want or they can play a song or so on. I'm like, man, that would be freaking cool, yeah. you know? Yeah. And like little things like that. And Ben Ark, if you're listening to this freaking <laughs> podcast, <laughs> respond to me and Matt. <laughs> you literally have a place to stay. Mm. Uh, and we just I really want to go back to 2019 when you helped me personally, uh, Lightning Fi, before Lightning was a thing, the yeah. pinball machines of Bitcoin 2019. So Ben, come on. Super fun stuff. Um, but again, I digress around, uh, around that point. Mm -hmm. Um, where I get a little nervous is around the sustainability and I'll compare it to, um, uh, the meetup world that I'm okay. really invested in. So okay. like the meetup community is so freaking amazing. It's like the, like these people that are, and again, I don't want to compare meetup organizers to open source uh, developers, but these meetup organizers from all around the, the world spend their time, their most precious resource to just set up a meetup, whether at a bar or a specific mm -hmm. place to bring people together to talk about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. How cool is that with no true financial reward? Mm -hmm. Uh, and they do that consistently. Many do. Mm -hmm. Some some people may fall off, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and no, no disrespect to them for doing that. Um, but then, like, what are other incentives that we can put in place, not to make the financial incentives so uh, worthwhile, but then help them just to continue to support that? And that's where, like, going back to the open source world, it's like with these grants that are coming in, you guys are coming in from a parent company block that is very... Now, I don't know the financials, but I'm going to mm -hmm. say since you're a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. that it's more stable than it is from me that's like, you know, well over my skis with this crazy project at the Bitcoin Park. Mm -hmm. um, I guess 
And then we can shed a little light on your framework and blog post because I love the ideas around how do we make uh, contributing to open source more sustainable and how you can make getting into open source more attainable. Mm. Yeah, so I, I mean, I wrote a proposed framework for like sustainable open source Bitcoin development. Um, I think at this point, from what I've seen in my experience, people, once they realize some of these avenues are available, they do see a career in Bitcoin as a serious thing, as a serious career path. Um, there's still a part of me that really wants to keep the volunteer aspect of things really strong i think most people that enter open source in any way are doing it on a voluntary basis and are doing it for the love and craftsmanship yep. of that thing and i think that is ultimately like the core of it when you do start bringing in money and financial stuff a con a really strong conscious effort has to be at play to avoid you know misalignment of incentives and you know making sure things are done with the right principles in mind um but having said that um spiral is a, is an initiative at block and we're definitely blessed to be able to have the funding to support people to start their careers and not have to worry about their livelihood essentially um not be that older footballer that's like we, we need <laughs> yeah. to give a little bit more we need to earn these three points so i can pay yeah. off my uh mortgage yeah. this month yeah exactly i mean we're not giving out retirement money <laughs> yet, yet anyway and, um, and i will say this even like investing in early stage companies yeah. it's like you can't give them enough that where they become so cushioned on the money that they have there needs to be enough of a carrot that there's enough of a desire to mm. do more and i'm not saying that's like the open source world but yeah it can't be Hey, here's a million dollars. Now exactly. go and work on, you know, exactly. open source for the next three months. Yeah, exactly. Um, so to touch on the framework a little bit, just to very briefly run through it, and I'd love to just get like the community's feedback on it. Am I totally off my rocket or am I on to sign something a little bit? So typically it will start with this whole idea of like a proof of concept. Someone has an idea how they can, you know, improve Bitcoin's decentralization or privacy. And they might be a lone wolf or they might there might be one or two of them who have this idea. Um, and they need essentially some like seed funding to, to borrow a term from like angel investing and stuff to get them kind of up and running. Um, so this stage would typically involve them creating some type of like alpha software or um, some type of mock-up of their idea and maybe like a successful exit from that stage looks like them having like a mature code base that other contributors can come into really strong documentation that outlines how you can get involved in a project, why the project's important, um, what area of Bitcoin it's going to touch on. Um, so you get really early proof of concept stage. Then phase two is all about like community building because you know, the more eyes you have on your project, the more developers, the more um, testers, the more users, ultimately the stronger the, the piece of software becomes. So the more people you've got reviewing, the more totally. people you've got auditing, um, the more people you've got using it, finding bugs, it's, it's very important. So building up a community around that, starting to um, encourage external contributions from non-lead maintainers, let's say. Yeah. And that can be in a variety of different ways. It might just be someone who, I'm going to run the Twitter account for this project. I'm going to write some documentation for you. I'm going to do some YouTube videos showing people how to use your project. I'm a dev. I'm going to contribute some feature stuff to your to your project. Um, and a lot of communities now are, are building around, you know, asynchronous communication platforms like Discord or mm -hmm. Slack or IRC. So you got to make sure you have all of that stuff set up maybe working on your brand in a little bit. We do have a Bitcoin design community as well now, so you could easily lead into the guys over there if you're like someone who just wants to work on software, doesn't want to do any branding, doesn't want to do any of the like quote-unquote more marketing-y type, marketing type stuff. Or um, community stuff. Like commu you just need somebody beating that drum. Like exactly. shout out to Pavel next. Yeah, Like he's like example. an inspiration, yeah, you know, from BTC example. Pay. Exactly. And he's a grantee of Exactly, he's a spiral grantee yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, super bummed he's not here uh, <laughs> yeah. this week. We love Pav. Um, but like, that's 
one thing, and I will say, I think the audience here for builders in Bitcoin is on the more n probably non-technical side, mm -hmm. but loves Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect, perfect way perfect. to way to get in. Like I'll, I'll use Discord as a perfect example because you brought that up. Yeah, you need a, a majority of these projects. Like Linux, you know, was started by Linus Storval. I think yeah. I got the name right. Yeah, I mean that's the one guy, but it's an the, the open source project basically. You need somebody beating that drum, even on Discord, organizing, you know, the communication and getting the communication going, following up. Like life is just about consistency and follow up. I'm like resigned yeah. to those two things. It's like <laughs> yeah. show up, be consistent, and then follow up. You'll win a lot in life. Um, but you need a lot of those people in open source because you could have that, you know, uh, you know, Carlos Tevez over there <laughs> on his island as a software dev, just yeah. crushing it. Yeah. But then you need that magical, you know, coach like Gianfranco Zola, exactly. who used to be an amazing attacking midfielder, yeah. to be able to distribute him the football. Totally. And you need all these kind of players. Then when all of a sudden those pieces are together and they're, they're connecting, a lot of beautiful things can then happen. So like, don't discount what you are working on, whether you're a front end dev, you're a designer totally. and, and it's by the a way, writer, copywriters, copywriter, even like all, this is a very bad example, but what's the asset that, uh, uh, Matt has and I have, okay. We have a beautiful, um, campus here mm -hmm. and we were very fortunate that you guys kind of took us up on this offer of like coming here and working here for a bit of time. Mm -hmm. That means the world to us, but I hope it like is a really big benefit to y'all to be able to do this, you know, and think about maybe another place or come back here and so on to be able to continue to co collaborate. But I say that because that's our, the small token of contribution mm -hmm. that we make, but I hope it echoes for a long, long time across maybe bringing somebody else into the uh, open source project. Um, I know I kind of rambled there, but I, my long story long is it does not matter what you're doing. There's probably a role for you in the open source community. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, even if you just look at closed source software, the app, like Cash App as an organization has like thousands of employees and, you know, it's, when it boils down to it, it's like a, it's quite a simple application yeah. <laughs> on, on your phone, right? So like if it's, if it's taken, you know, that many people to, 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 you know, to develop that product then you know people can look at it in that terms as well and look at it as like we're building bitcoin products this is a team effort yeah. it needs everything from copywriters to animators to designers to marketers to legal people potentially to like it literally the the your skill set can contribute and this is literally. maybe a good segue into like hello bitcoin yeah like, i'll touch on the last two points yeah. of the of the framework yeah, yeah, yeah. very quickly um the last two points is phase three is maybe like multi-entity funding mm -hmm. so a lot of these projects um typically rely on funding from one source but we like to think once a project has reached um a, a significant level of consensus from the wider bitcoin community and um, gain some tractions from traction from larger organizations and the organizations see benefit in these projects they will start to also contribute um, we've seen it in instances like btc pay server which totally. had us funding them okay coin i think gemini in the past so there, there are examples where a project will develop like a foundation or some sort of legal entity that makes it a bit easier for large organizations to funnel money into them because large organizations they don't really want to have to do the 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 due diligence on individual contributors and things of that nature but they say so, oh that xyz project is awesome we can donate directly to that foundation and the people within that project can distribute the funds as they see fit because they're the closest to the project and then the last the last bit is like sustainable without spiral or sustainable without some large organization. Yeah. You should be able to walk, spiral should be able to take away their funding. Another organization should be able to take away their funding and the project still run smoothly and not be at risk of, you know, stopping or, or, or anything of that nature. So, yeah, those are those are the four phases. If, if people are interested, they can read more about it on, on spiral.xyz and, yeah, give me some feedback. Let me and we're going to definitely link to it in in the show notes. Um, that's for sure. So we're going to get to Hello Bitcoin, okay. how that started. But let me ask you one question. Yeah. Um, we're 
mates growing up. You made it to West Ham. I didn't make it to. Sh- I'm the plumber, you know. And, and no disrespect <laughs> no, to the plumber, no, you know. Can, so just on. like, yeah. I, slight riff, but man, we need more like electricians, plumbers, Hun- painters. Listen, all my friends that stay doing plumbing and they're now in their early 30s they're like living in the suburbs like yeah. four or five bedroom houses like with kids didn't, with kids ha- didn't, happy. Didn't, didn't go to university yeah. didn't like do, go to try and climb this corporate ladder like 100. running their own businesses i'm like they're living the life man so one thousand percent we need in, more in, of it i don't so, know why it's not cool anymore to do a trade like i don't know if that's the case over here in the u.s but back home it's not as cool to do trades and stuff so i don't know i actually think it's going to become very cool very quickly here, okay. especially I'll, I'll speak for Tennessee in a way. Um, for my kids, if they don't, I mean, I got more kids than Bitcoin, uh, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, but I think, and personally, I think being able to do things with your hands mm-hmm. that are sustainable for a uh, profession that you do something, it's like a value for value in the most perfect way. Like, mm. I'm going to go fix your toilet. And you're going to give me uh, something of value in return, which is typically the local currency. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that same shit, no pun intended, happens at your house and you're able to fix that or hang up something or change a light bulb. I mean, all of these things that go into it are so needed right now, but yet we are not, for some reason, we are just not putting an emphasis on that. We are just putting it on more of, again, no disrespect to any of these other areas. Of course, of course. But, um, I couldn't agree more with you. And it's, that, it's typically at its, at its less stress, right? It's like, not though, you, man. Like it, it's it's got to be less stress. Like you just you know you turn up to people's homes. You oh, fix, that yeah, regard. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You fix the thing and you yeah. go home. You don't have to worry about any corporate politics. Exactly. Like this, oh, they're that, gonna let other. me go. It's <laughs> like I. It, it's binary. Did I fix the toilet or did I not fix the toilet? And that's where I. So I, when I used to manage some like um, enterprise tech teams, and I would always say like. Um, you can't teach a professional how to clean a toilet. Mm. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm like, the separation is in the preparation and it's all about the details. So how do you clean a toilet? And they'll be like, I don't clean a toilet. They're like, let me tell you how I clean a toilet. Mm-hmm. And I pull out like, I mean, this is how crazy I am, man. You're like <laughs> laughing at me, but this is how fucking crazy I am. I'd take out a toothbrush and I'd be like, this is the level of detail. We need to go and clean this freaking toilet. Like, look at, oh, at first we take the toilet paper and we rinse it one time down. Mm-hmm. Then we go and take the toilet, the, the toothbrush and the bristles and then we clean Take it right here and yeah. then here and around. And like, wh- what? Like, this is what excellence looks like. And then there's mediocrity and right. then there's everything else. Right. 100%. And this is what we're going to uh, uh, strive for. Um, anyways, that was a <laughs> the big time tangent. Um, so hey, how did you get into Hello Bitcoin? Hello, Bitcoin. Um, and by the way, we do need more on this educational side. So whether it's yeah. like a commercial podcast or so on, but, you know, I yeah. joke with Matt, Peter McCormack, you know, uh, all these guys, they're like, we have so many Bitcoin podcasts. And I'm like, actually, we need more. And they, they agree, I believe, too. Yeah. We just need more people creating content, whether it's for one, an audience of one or an audience of 10 to 100. In different whatever. ways as well, right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. And that's why I'm, I'm very Im- impressed with Hello Bitcoin. And I'm still waiting for the next uh, episode. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We, we've got an announcement coming out about that, actually. But um, yeah, so Hello Bitcoin is an educational effort started by my friend Matt Belez. Um He's a very um, passionate Bitcoiner, passionate about education. Um, and he just wanted to give back to the Bitcoin community in this capacity. Um, with the kind of TLDR that we wanted it to be uh, s- very different from perhaps what you see in the Twitter sphere where, you know, if you was to send someone to learn about Bitcoin on Twitter, it can be quite a traumatizing experience perhaps. Like we like... <laughs> You know, so I'd like to learn about this crypto. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? Stay poor. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, like, it's yeah. my mom going on Twitter for yeah. the first time, like, yeah, a, a spinning like, up an account. I mean, like, I'm here for all of it. I yeah. love all of the banter, innit? I've totally. been I've been in the space a while. I love all the banter, but I mean, for a beginner, it's probably not the best place you want to send them, you know. So we thought, like, we want to put a bit of a different take on it. Have a like a friendly place to come and learn about Bitcoin, where everyone's smiling, everyone's happy, where you know we're focused. Focused on the like, uh, the why, the what, the the principles, totally. the positive side of Bitcoin, and just trying to break it down in a way that you know, hopefully, the average person will be able to understand. You know, someone like 
my mother or just like my friend who maybe is not as tech savvy as I am. Um, so yeah, so far we've had, I think we're on episode five or, yep. or four. Um, so yeah, I think that the first one was just like an outline of like what Bitcoin is and why it's important. Um, the second one was more of a technical deep dive into how it works. Um, we've had uh, Aubrey and Magrashki talk about like mining and energy um so yeah i mean it, it definitely people should to watch the videos on youtube and stuff totally and i love the resources that you're putting out from an education standpoint like bitcoin mytho mythology.org yeah. is another great um site in the sense that just yeah. breaking down each of these myths yeah. yeah because anytime you even say the word bitcoin it just totally. it for the average person that's not eating and breathing and sleeping Bitcoin Twitter and being a keyboard commando like me right. and others, you know, and, uh, you know, organizing meetups and devoting their time, capital, reputation. They're just like, what's this Bitcoin thing? Like you back in 2017, let's get rich yeah. or let's learn about the money is broken. How yeah. is there a better money out yeah. there? I mean, I, I've personally been like a bit, a bit disappointed with many of the narratives over the last maybe two or three years that have been pushed to like the average person all the way to like sell your house and buy Bitcoin <laughs> yeah. type of stuff. Like, I, I mean, I, I'm as, I'm as, let's say, I don't really like that word. I just prefer to call myself a Bitcoin. but like Bitcoin maxi. I'm like all in. I'm, yeah. I'm as maxi as they come in terms of what I do. Like everything. Where are you I spending eat? your time, Connor? Where <laughs> yeah, are you like, spending your capital? Exactly. And where are you spending your reputation? Exactly. Those three areas, you're all in on Bitcoin. Exactly. So there's no like deviation of. Yeah. And then when you may, and I'm not trying to put words in your of mouth, course, yeah. but you may say to your mother. Yeah. Okay, mom, you have a different aspiration in life because you're at a different stage in life. Yeah. You know, you're a hundred, let's say using a hundred dollars, maybe 20 of those dollars is it devoted into Bitcoin because mm -hmm. you need 80 for, you know, to live the rest of her mm -hmm. next, like, you know, 30%, 40% of her life. Mm -hmm. It's just different exactly. versus like sell everything, level yeah. up on debt yeah. and YOLO into a interest bearing account with BlockFi <laughs> to the moon. Yeah, exactly. And um, I just think there's so much room for different storytelling in our space i feel like we haven't even touched the surface with the kind of stories we can tell around bitcoin i still think we limit ourselves to maybe you know digital gold narratives and things and and they are narratives that we should um take seriously and and, and are true for the most part but bitcoin is so much more than that to me anyway and um yeah that was just the effort to you know try and bring a bring a bit more fun and and uh friendliness to to bitcoin and so now knowing that you live in miami <laughs> knowing the flight schedule and how easy it is to fly from miami to nashville yeah two what was it two hours or something nothing yeah. nothing and uh so we're here at the the park we do a monthly meetup on a different topic so uh, january was mining february <laughs> is free and open source software march is economics and incentives of bitcoin <laughs> april is design Oh, cool. So a little breaking news if you've been listening to this pod up until this point, and now I'm going to solicit your help as well. Awesome. But Stephen DeLorme and I are all Stephen's gonna, great. Yeah, Love big Steven. shout out to him. Um, we're going to be putting together a framework for a one-day design summit. So we're okay. going to be inviting designers, creators, and um, uh, artists here You're in the, the perfect park. city for that, right? Nashville here has got a big creative scene. So Totally. And it is... It's oozing with creativity, optimism, and I mean, it's kind of crazy. This is like, you know, Austin's for sure, like, let's call it the Bitcoin capital of the world. You know, there's other these, you know, monikers. Yeah. But if you want to come here and see people living yeah. a Bitcoin lifestyle yeah. without Bitcoin, it's here in the state of Tennessee, in my humble opinion. Got you. Um, but we want to create like, so one of the areas that I've noticed especially uh, in like b following the Bitcoin design community and probably is the same in the open source development community as well uh, for Bitcoin is there's probably like 90 plus percent are lurkers and trying to figure out where they can fit in. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the five, 10 percent or maybe even less that are the most vocal or response mm -hmm. uh, and they're leading the the conversation. So mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. how do we create a one day summit where we bring people together in real life mm -hmm 
to maybe they're not the best on communicating on a Discord mm-hmm. or a Slack channel or even on Twitter, but they're able to come in real life and learn f- and shake a Connor Okus's hand mm-hmm. from uh, Spiral or a Stephen DeLorme from the Bitcoin design community and really learn and be like, ah, okay, like maybe I can work on the Zeus wallet here mm-hmm. or the, you know, join market over there. And mm-hmm. this is what, you know... Uh, you know, again, I just want to make it more accessible because I do think these in-person meetups and potentially summits that are highly focused, totally. not on just Bitcoin, the capital B and Bitcoin, the reserve asset, but specifically lightning, open source, mining, totally. and these other areas um, can go it's a definitely, way. It's definitely an awareness thing as well because the amount of people I speak to who don't even know that you could have a career in Bitcoin and that there are it's not just Bitcoin Core. Like totally. Bitcoin is not just Bitcoin Core. It's like there's so much infrastructure pieces around it. We have layer twos now. Yeah. Who knows? In a few years, we may have layer threes, which opens up a whole ecosystem of projects for people to work on. So identifying the projects people can get involved in, outlining those in talks, making introductions for people. That's a large part of what I do because I speak to so many people in so many different projects. I can kind of, oh, this guy can connect with this guy and he's got the skills to help him. And like matchmaking essentially is, is a big part of what I do as well. Um, uh, so you're saying you're going all the way back to the uh, eight-year-old, ten-year-old Connor Okus, the attacking midfielder, just connecting. Yeah, just connecting the dots. Just connecting yeah, the dots. like assist through balls, anything you want, I can deliver. So um, and and then you were the one that made Carlos Tevez, Carlos Tevez, though, right? Ah uh, man, I can't take all the you know <laughs> I can't take all the claim. Like I might have played a small role <laughs> in <What>? some <laughs> of that, but no, 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 Carlos is. is He's, yeah, he's a, he's a baller. He's a big baller. Yeah, man. Um, um, well, this hour literally went like this. I know, man. And Sorry, I'm, I ramble sometimes, but, you, you don't. know. <laughs> the thing is, like, especially these podcasts, and you and for anyone who's listening, please invite Connor. Like, I, I, there's already going to be V2, and we may even do V2 here at the park. Like, it's got to be. It's got to be. Yeah. I'm flying in. It's only two hours away, like you said. I'm here, man. I'm yeah. Here. I'm putting in the schedule. The schedule, the design summit, there's like already like three other ideas I have. But Connor, uh, best way for people to find you? Uh, find me, prob- probably Twitter. You can hit me up on Twitter. I'm pretty responsive on DMs and stuff. So just my full name, Connor Okus. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to find me. Yeah. I'm going to leave you with one question. Over, under. It's an over, under question. Okay. Over, under 20 years. Because you're on the board of Real Bedford. Yep. Over under 20 years Mm -hmm. is Real Bedford in the Premier League. And is that a true statement that they will be in the Premier League? Over and true statement. So actually, let's just say this. In the next 30 years, uh, yes or no, is Real Bedford in the Premier League? Yes. Fucking A. Tom Maxwell. Premier League. Okay, we've got to buy some... uh, Think about where Bitcoin's price is going to be in 30 years. And I don't even talk about price, but we're going to have like this treasure chest of like, we can buy any player in the world we want. And now I'm only joking. I'm joking. Well, but. no, but you know, to, to be honest with you, like that's, so the the other side, which I kind of love and I hate as well, it's like the people that have the most money can use those bullets to acquire the best players. And and, and build the best infrastructure. And then, yeah. exactly. So then they, but they could miss out on maybe building the best academies and the best infrastructure and then just wait, be like, hey, we're at the top of the funnel. We're just going to go buy the best talent and go buy them from Ajax. And, uh, I, Ajax or Ajax? Uh, I say Ajax. Ajax yeah. and the Barcelona academies and all these different top tier academies yeah. rather than building up the true foundation yeah. and just go that route. But yeah. um, I'm looking forward to V2, man. So yeah. thank you so much for joining no problem, me. Man. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Cheers. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Connor as much as I did. The energy and focus Connor brings to the organization of open source development makes him a real asset to Bitcoiners of all technical capabilities, including non-developers like yours truly. If you're enjoying the pod and want to automatically stay up to date, please like and subscribe in your favorite podcasting app and make sure auto download is on. This would also mean the world to me. Lastly, come visit us in Nashville at Bitcoin Park. Go to bitcoinpark.co and see all the ways to connect with us and stay up to date. We may have a new domain to direct you towards soon as well. Until next time, 